Welcome to Fit and Chips Chats. This is a podcast for women over 40 who are looking for sane and frank advice about their health and wellness, especially through menopause. I'm Amanda Thieb, the original resilient bitch and menopause guru. In my work as a personal trainer and nutrition coach, and through my own personal experience, it became obvious to me information about menopause and this curious phase of our life was so ridiculously hard to find. And that's why I started this podcast. Join me every week as I speak to health and wellness experts on hot topics that directly impact you. I've made it my mission to help you by exploding a few myths, presenting you with the facts and hoping to inspire you to be a healthy, strong person just like me. If you like this show, please subscribe and leave a review. Then go and tell your friends and then go and tell your husband and then tell the neighbor. And then don't forget to visit me at fitandchips.com. And now let's get started on today's show. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to this week's episode of Fit and Chips Chats. This week on the show, I have Jane Simpson. Jane has had her own private practice for 22 years. She is a pelvic floor expert. She treats patients with all forms of incontinence and pelvic floor dysfunction. She's a member of the Pelvic Floor Society. Who knew that existed? This is the first time I found out about that. The Association for Continence Advice and the International Continence Society. And we're going to talk about her first book. She's hoping to spread, spread the word about the pelvic floor. The book is called The Pelvic Floor Bible. Everything you need to know to prevent and cure problems at every stage of your life. Welcome to the show, Jen. Hello. Hello, Amanda. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, loud and clear. So it's great. It's great to have you on the show. So let's get started. So you say in your book, there there are an estimated 200 million people around the world that suffer from some form of urinary incontinence. And is that of that number? Do you think that more women than men suffer from incontinence? Yes, absolutely. Um, At least twice as many, uh, mainly because women have babies. And we also suffer the menopause, which causes vaginal atrophy and all sorts of things which can make um, problems worse. Men in general don't have pelvic floor dysfunction until they have some form of prostate issue, um, possibly having prostate surgery. So there's much less chance as men aren't having babies that they are going to suffer Um, with pelvic floor dysfunction it's very much more common in women and it's a very very underreported and a terribly taboo subject still which is why I've written my book in a hope that we make this a normal mainstream thing like going to the gym doing yoga doing pilates keeping fit Um, pelvic floor exercises and strengthening muscles should be the same so you know you were just saying that it's very embarrassing and very taboo. And I also think that there's this perception. And so I think even I had that perception maybe five years ago before I went through menopause completely, um, that um, incontinence issues happen to old people. You know, we see the, the, the incontinence pants that depends on the shelves and we just associate those with somebody other than ourselves when I've realized that's far from true right and I've struggled yeah, it is. struggled with incontinence myself and then and this is after having children 15 years prior I never expected it to happen to me and I was absolutely devastated by it so why do you think that we have this perception of incontinence only being about old people what is it about like the way that we talk about the whole incontinence problem I think that we've uh, just it, we just haven't talked about it. I think that there is a, a thought that um, our pelvic floor muscles are, or our pelvic floor you can't see it. It's it's sort of hidden away down there. Um, I think that we are um, struggling with the rigors of everyday life, um, which makes it very hard to get round to doing something about it. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have uh, got a little something, a little thing in a box that you bought a few years ago and have used once or twice, or not at all, or a leaflet on your pelvic floor exercises. And I think the intention is there in us to do our pelvic floor exercises, but I'm not sure what's stopping us. We just need to make pelvic floor dysfunction, which is such a common condition, talked about and part of our daily life. I just 
don't get why strong and well-functioning pelvic floor muscles, um, which should be really important to us, just like everything else, have always been sort of a bit to do. And I think it's probably that we just think, well, I've had a baby, so what do I expect? This is normal. But it isn't normal, and it's very curable. Which is great to hear. And that's what the, the one thing <laughs> I want women to, as mainly women listen to the show, that things like this can yeah. Preventable and curable. And so let's talk about the pelvic floor itself and let's talk about the type of issues that people might, uh, women might struggle with, with their pelvic floor, because it's not such a straightforward um, subject topic. And I know from myself, from the fitness industry and the anatomy and physiology side, that the pelvic floor doesn't work in isolation. It works together with um, other parts of the internal core system. And so um, can we just talk about the type of things that you see and the type of dysfunctions that you see? Absolutely. And I, I suppose the, the commonest thing is stress incontinence when you sneeze or cough or laugh or um, jump. And certainly I think uh, most menopausal women would be slightly terrified of the trampoline or the skipping rope. But um, I think that that's possibly the most common thing. And, and it's something that women will say, well, oh, well, it only happens, you know, if I do a big sneeze with a full bladder, so that's okay, isn't it? And it jolly well isn't okay. I think the second possibly mo most common thing is overactive bladder. So it's the um, standing on your doorstep, step, absolutely desperate, legs crossed, trying to get the key in the door, racing to the toilet before disaster strikes, trying to get your knickers down before you've wet yourself. And again, people are sort of putting up with that as though that's, well, you know, it happens occasionally. Or, but actually it happens to a lot of people when they literally see their front door. Um, or they're at the bottom of the street and they can see their front door and they're thinking, oh, my God, will I ever make it to the house? Yeah, we can't, is, um, that, I've heard that um, talked about here as the urinary urge incontinence. I don't know if it's that's right. in, in the UK. Okay, right. But that's the Yeah, so urge incontinence or the overactive bladder, they, yeah, they are one and the same little horror. And... Um, Definitely, I think, happen possibly a little bit more um, when you get towards menopause as you start to have less estrogen in the vagina and the tissues are thinning and you um, get this urgency problem slightly more. And the next sort of thing on my list has to be prolapse. I think uh, vaginal prolapse is massive and at least 50% of us who've had kids probably got a degree of, of vaginal prolapse. If it's first degree, you probably don't even know it's there. Um, but putting extra strains on the pelvic floor when you have a little bit of prolapse could turn a, a first degree prolapse into a second or a third degree one where you are then in, in trouble. But again, very lots of things you can do about it that don't involve surgery. And I think people maybe are afraid. They think they've got a prolapse, it's an operation. And there are now lots of things out there like um, vaginal pessaries which can be used um, I had a patient actually who um, <laughs> walked Hadrian's wall um, with a vaginal pessary and she had quite a significant prolapse so it's about empowering women to be able to help themselves with various bits of equipment or I mean obviously the ultimate goal is that your pelvic floor gets so strong that you don't need bits of equipment but if you do you should be able to know about them so you don't have to um, suffer in silence anymore. I know that when I had incontinence through perimenopause and it, well, I didn't have it after my children, mm -hmm. years later I had it through perimenopause, um, I felt like I was educated enough in the, in the system of how the pelvic floor works in conjunction with everything. I didn't have diastasis, rectus, I didn't have lower back issues my diaphragm yeah. was working fine you know everything was working fine but something was was stopping me and I actually had stress incontinence and I remember going for a run in the hills of Scotland I was home and um, I was visiting my husband's parents and I was running down the hill and I looked down and I drenched myself and I was I didn't even know it happened I was absolutely horrified and I couldn't work out why it happened I ended up at the time I was living in Toronto and when I went back, I went to see a pelvic health physiotherapist and the only way I could actually identify what the problem was, was because I had something tangible, like an internal exam. And for me, yes. it was, for me, it was actually, I, I 
was hypertonic my, in my sphincter, like my glutes were too tight. And so I couldn't actually activate my pelvic floor properly. It was interesting. And I know that if I had done traditional Kegels, I would have created more tension and instead of actually trying to release through the areas that were causing me problems. And so I am like a huge fan of pelvic health physiotherapist I think every woman should just get one free in the post I think everyone (laughs) I think so have access to that well Mm. so that I think was going to be like my next type of question like is there like a a, there isn't a one-size-fits-all in in like from the stories I've heard women you know give me but like is there something that every woman should be doing that would help them doesn't matter what their issues are or is it literally down to each individual it's it's a good question and I and that in my practice is what I do which is to tailor what I do per, for each individual but and sadly I don't think I mean I think there's so many women with pelvic floor dysfunction that they can't all see someone or don't all want to they maybe want to make their own way And I think that um, I'm a very big fan of tools and gadgets to do with the pelvic floor. So um, easy things are, um, there's an app called Squeezy, so that can help you do your Kegel exercises. The problem with um, that is, are you doing it right? Yeah. And that is a big, big issue for me. Are you using the right muscles? Um, And so um, I've tried in my book to give really good hints about things that you know you can do like for example put a tampon in your vagina and try and pull it out and see if you can you know do a tug of war um maybe try to put your finger in your vagina and squeeze it and see if you can feel the pelvic floor lifting yeah um simple things like that but otherwise there are lots of things that are out there on the market I mean the most um, expensive one is the LV trainer which has um, a great biofeedback use you use it with your mobile phone and you have a an app that when you contract you put the LV in you when you contract you can you follow a five minute program and I think that for the modern woman is fantastic five minutes you follow the program you don't have to plan anything you just do what it tells you and then it tells you how you're doing over time and I think we all, all like biofeedback. We're all with our uh, Fitbit and, you know, things like that. That's what the modern world is like. It's, it's, it's not like the days of Arnold Kegel where he gave everyone um, something called a perineometer. And um, you inserted the probe into your vagina and it had a, a dial which <laughs> looked a bit like a car speedometer. Oh, um, and he got his ladies. So remember, we're now in the 1950s. And he got his ladies to um, use it for 20 minutes, three times a day. Now, if we think of the modern woman, I'm not sure that uh, we've all got 20 minutes, three times a day to insert the perineometer and uh, contract our pelvic floor muscles. But if we have something that's doable, that's the important thing. It's doable. Are you using the right muscles and are you doing it often enough? And if you can get those three, three things right, you will improve your pelvic floor so vaginal weights for example that's a great bit of kit that's really easy to use it's not expensive and it's vaginal weightlifting you can do it in the shower in the morning and off you go then you don't need to think about your muscles again for the rest of the day Um, and if your muscles are really 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 poor then electrical stimulation is the way to go and you know I have lots of patients who when I examine them we can't make any pelvic floor effort at all and there's no point whatsoever like you say telling them to do their pelvic floor exercises or their kegels because <laughs> they can't and so if you use a vaginal electrode and stimulate the muscles I mean obviously some women can't do this but um, the majority of women could if required so if when you put your finger in your vagina and try to squeeze it you can't feel anything whatsoever Maybe electrical stimulation is the way forward. And I think at that point, probably a trip to the women's health physiotherapist or the continent specialist like me would be the way forward because you just need probably a bit more guidance. Bit more but guidance. there are some... But, but you're yeah. saying there's things that women can do on Absolutely. their own before. Because, in, I mean, I'm here in the United States and actually having access to a pelvic health physiotherapist isn't 
within everybody's reach purely because of insurance purposes. We have direct, of course. direct access in a lot of states that allows us to go directly to a physiotherapist without a referral from a doctor. But then if the insurance doesn't cover them, it can be quite challenging. And so I know a lot of women are, are like really really struggling to find the, the, the right thing to do for them. And for me, historically, I've, um, I've lived through the age of like badly, badly instructed Kegels that, you mm. know, we went through a, a phase of telling women to overly clench our um, pelvic floor. That was particularly in the United States. And, um, and then also my, my other question was with the vaginal weights, do you think that are they appropriate for everybody? Is that the type of thing that everybody should use? Because I have heard conflicting, um, you know, advice from those, like, for example, in, in my situation where I was hypertonic, where I had too much tension, um, I was told that vaginal wits would actually be the worst thing for me. I actually needed to learn how to relax again. <laughs> was, yes, no, if, if that's the situation, of course. Yeah. Um, and really, vaginal weights are good for someone whose pelvic floor is a little bit weak. Um, uh, it's, they, it, it, obviously, they won't work if you have a prolapse, particularly a uterine prolapse, because they're just then pushed out. Pressure. But I think what I'm trying to say is that everything has a place. Yeah. And, um, you know, there are little bits of kit out there that aren't, you know, going to break the bank that would would be helpful to some women. So at least we are now, we do have choice. Um, the problem is, you know, have you got the right thing for you? But at least if you're doing something, that's better than nothing. I have um, to say that, like, when I know when I was given exercises to do, and I'm an exercise professional, it's what I do <laughs> my level, I it literally would be the last thing I wanted to do because I think the problem with pelvic floor act exercises is they're boring. And and they require you to you know, like actually like focus on something that's very intrinsic and internal, and it's not like doing a deadlift or doing some squats where you mm. get gratification. It feels very like it almost feels like you're not doing anything. I and I understand it clearly is, which is I think probably why the biofeedback um, tool does work because you're actually getting results and I think we're a results driven um, community aren't we in general I we think are we all want to win <laughs> that's right and actually I had two ladies who were doing that uh, the biofeedback thing um they were they were great friends and um I mean I didn't know that uh, you know either of them knew each other and they'd met for coffee and they'd confided in each other that they'd been to see me um and um then they started competing with each other <laughs> and who whoever had the strongest muscles with their biofeedback um was was to have to buy lunch for the other one and, 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 that's and they funny. were they were <laughs> such cool girls and they were both you know like my age and they were you know, they, in fact, I think they both had three children. They were like 50 something. They were both fit. They, you know, but they both had stressy content. And it was hysterical. They had this, uh, this, this competition. Can you and it was, the, it was great. Where to come up with the final check? And she goes, no, I'm getting this because my vagina is stronger than hers. <laughs> yeah. It was true. I mean, it's as true as I'm yeah. telling you. It was, it was one of my best stories. And, uh, you know, if we could all be a bit more like that, obviously we, we don't want a, a sort of world of women competing with each other on, on London Underground. But um, I think we, we, if we can, um, we just need to sort of embrace it somehow. And it's weird that, that we, we don't, I mean, we were never, ever going to leave the house without cleaning our teeth. So why would you not do your pelvic floor exercises if you've got stress incontinence or you can't make it to the front door before yeah. you're wetting yourself? I mean, it's just, it's quite weird that we'll put up with that when it's so easily fixed. And I think if yeah. we associate it to our teeth cleaning um, and every yeah. time you're cleaning your teeth, you're doing your pelvic floor exercises, we would have a, a, a world of stronger pelvic floor muscles. Yeah, and I think that you, you've hit the nail on the head. Like, we, why do we put up with it, right? And yeah. I, I was saying to you before we started recording that, you know, I often get asked to, like, promote products and et cetera, and I, it's just not something I, I enjoy doing. But 
the, the amount uh, easily every week I get three or four emails from people selling products for incontinence and maybe it comes from a place that's you know to support women as they're going through their treatment but for mm. me I don't want to be seen to be promoting this because I want women to feel empowered to actually go and get help and find a way to sort of like cure what would is happening to them, not just to put up with it by having to think, oh, well, today I'll just wear depends. It, there has to be something more for women to look forward to than the idea of spending the second half of their life literally in diapers. It's, it's well, exactly. Be- yeah. And we're going to spend a third of our life in the menopause. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you, if you actually um, look in a supermarket trolley of um, older women, you know, quite often they've got sanitary towels in there. Why? Mm-hmm. They're not having periods. They, they're using them for incontinence because they're too shy to buy, you know, incontinence pads. And I, I really think that we have to move away from that, oh, well, just wear a panty liner to go, well, why am I wearing a panty liner? Why aren't I fixing this problem? Because it is easily fixed. And I think certainly at the menopause, um, vaginal estrogen is one of my big things. I, I really do feel that... We are lacking in vaginal estrogen and nobody is, or not enough women are being treated for that problem. So let's talk I examine about, women let, every day. Let, Sorry. Yeah, let's talk about menopause. Let's talk mm. about what happens in menopause. It would be really good if you could like give an explanation of, like, you know, I, I have talked about this before on the show, but it's just really good for women to sort of be reminded that some things are going to be out of their control. So can you tell us what happens through perimenopause? leading up to menopause? As far as well, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's vagina. I mean, as, as, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, obviously we all know the dreaded hot flushes, night sweats and all the rest of it, but vaginal atrophy um, can creep up upon us. And interestingly, um, I think women um, who aren't having hormone replacement therapy, and as we know, that's only 10% of women still are using HRT, which is is a shame that it that again is another area of, of great taboo and Louise Newsom is a is a big advocate of trying to un- make people more aware of, of yeah. the real you know benefits of it but um, I examine women every single day and particularly women who haven't had a vaginal delivery um, maybe had two cesarean sections and I look at them and I, I see this vaginal atrophy and I say to them you know when was the last time you had intercourse? And they will say to me, oh, dear, no, I have, I've stopped. It's too painful. I haven't done it for two years. But my husband, you know, he doesn't really mind. Well, you know. And I say, well, do you want to have intercourse? And they're like, well, yeah, I'd like to. But, you know, it's so painful. I'm never doing that again. And I say, well, how about using some vaginal estrogen maybe? And, you know, with some vaginal estrogen, some good pelvic floor rehabilitation, I honestly have restored lots of women's sex lives. And that is a great joy to me to think that, you know, we, we've just given up on our sex lives because our vaginas are atrophied. I mean, that's just shocking. And it hurts and it's painful and it can cause, you know, pr- other problems. And I think, oh, yeah. I think that, um, so for, like, so what we, what we know in, in, in perimenopause as the estrogen starts to decline it's the integrity of the muscle right that breaks down there's a, a sense of atrophy for, to the skeletal muscle that happens right but what what I wanted to sort of like talk about is that like the, the bladder itself doesn't go through like the atrophy as far as I understand the smooth muscle like the org- organs isn't impacted but it's the muscles around surrounding that support the bladder is that correct yeah, so your your bladder isn't isn't going to suffer from it. Although some women do um, suffer with the, as you call, it, urge urge incontinence more at that time, um, really more because the uh, vagina has struggled with atrophy. And I think as intercourse then becomes more difficult and uncomfortable, um, it can set off sometimes more urinary tract infections, for example, yeah. and and. Uh, painful intercourse and also um the urge to run to the loo more frequently which can be really helped by uh, vaginal estrogen and pelvic floor rehabilitation um and a lot of women are just really struggling along completely unnecessarily yeah 
And, and the thing is that we know about the localized estrogen is that most women can use that regardless of their situation because it really is localized, right? It doesn't get into the, That's right. their system. Yeah, and I think that women, I know women who have gone through um, cancer and radiation and have not been eligible to do HRT mm. yet they still can do the localized estrogen and that's really helped them because I think those women as well are a little bit of a forgotten um forgotten yes group. they are yeah. and I think you know that um you know that is a, certainly something you need to discuss with your breast surgeon or uh, if it's been breast cancer or or your your doctor um but quite often it's absolutely fine and I think uh, it, that's just lack of knowledge by local doctors, possibly. Um, and they don't want to put any risk for the patient. So they say, oh, no, no, you can't use that. But I think you should take that further and absolutely check with your consultant um, whether or not you are able to use it if you know it would benefit you. Yeah. And so yeah, a woman has um, incontinence problem. She's really embarrassed about it. She's probably not even telling her husband because, you know, we tend to be private in that way and <laughs> doesn't know what to do about it what do you what, what are your suggestions I mean clearly by the book because there's a ton of information in there for them to help them but like if a woman goes to her GP it can be intimidating to start with a lot of women don't want to put themselves out there in front of the doctor and, and admit to something like this but who should they be talking to who should they be asking for a referral to like have you got any guidelines for helping women in their appointment scenario with their GP I think first of all we should talk to each other I think women need to empower each other to make this a much more normal thing to discuss. And, you know, as I said to you, there's a two page spread in today's Times newspaper. And so all those people who bought the Times newspaper today are reading this and thinking, oh, my God, this is this is something. And then maybe telling their friend, did you see that piece in the time? Because it's something that we just don't discuss. And quite often women come to me and they say, all my friends are asking, you know, we'll find out what happens when you go to see Jane. And so if we can start talking to each other more, then you'll be more empowered when the G to go to your GP. I had a, I had a patient actually went to their GP, um, all plucked up with their courage to say um, that they had this problem. And when they got there, it wasn't the normal doctor. It was a local doctor, a sort of youngish, you know, Adonis. And um, she, <laughs> she just said, that, oh, um, oh, I've had this terrible earache. And, I was, now. <laughs> yeah, no. and then she made an appointment to see me and she said, you cannot believe what is wrong with me. I, know, I could, just couldn't say it to this chat. But I think possibly if, if you're embarrassed, then go and see the female partner. Yeah, uh, I think women have got to be more sympathetic for, to women. Um, that is not against men. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't think that at all. But I think you know, women doctors who've had children will be more. You know, it's, it's definitely more empathetic because they understand that they've been through the process. And I think um, I'm hoping that with the, in the next few years we will have more women's health physiotherapists. Yeah. We will have more. Um, doctors who have a special interest in the subject and actually the more women are asking for help the more hopefully they will get help and um, as I say my my book is a good start because it it goes through the whole process and, it, and, and in fact um, the very first um, Amazon review which is just so heartening is a woman who said I got your book on the Kindle and I've read it and I thought I thought something was wrong with me but I didn't really know what it was and I now know I've got a dry vagina and a bit of a prolapse and I'm going straight off to my doctor so thank you very much brilliant and, and that's that is the education is key in all of this. that's it clearly I yeah. talk about menopause all the time but I mean um and this is a big part of it mm. and I think that if a woman feels empowered even if she just goes in with book or with like says listen I need a referral to a pelvic health physiotherapist I need to speak to somebody about incontinence like actually just go in and ask for that rather than having yeah. a conversation I feel as though um I understand why women don't want to talk to male doctors because I 
you can't make somebody feel empowered and confident when they're utterly embarrassed and ashamed. It doesn't matter if you're telling them not to be ashamed. I get that it can be anxiety inducing. And so given if a woman goes in and at least is educated and say, I can't leave here without this referral. I need to see a specialist. That's at least getting them on the right track to seeing someone who's going to be yes. empathetic and understand what's happening. I mean, because what I wanted to ask you about before we start finishing up is the um, surgery. Like, I know a lot of women that have just said, I can't do this. I'm going for surgery. I'm just going to. And it's an option that's given to women often. Do you think it's a lot of these surgeries are unnecessary, Jane? <laughs> Uh, surgery at the moment is a very difficult topic, particularly for stress incontinence, yeah. because um, there is a ban of uh, mesh-related products. So the simple procedure called a, um, a TVT, a tension-free vaginal tape, at the moment is not al- then allowed to perform it. So it's actually quite a major operation called a colpo suspension that's required to cure stress incontinence. Um, and I think even the surgeons are changing to, you know, if they can, if you can, for example, use a pessary, um, if you have a small prolapse uh, to allow you to be able to um, do your exercises or go for a run or just, you know, one of my patients likes to stand cooking for a long time. Um, and I think we will move away from surgery quite a lot. To, well, at the moment we have had to because of this um, a problem with mesh so um there is no quick fix for stress incontinence surgically i mean i do recommend people use for example like a large tampon in the vagina or there are various things out there on in the market for uh, trying to apply gentle pressure to the urethra if you want to do some physical exercises so you know i think absolutely we will start to move away from surgery and as i say the surgeons i work with I think are doing less and less operations. And I see a lot of patients who come to me who've been to the surgeon who say, well, I just thought he'd give me an operation and he sent me to you. So I think uh, that's good. That has to be good news. Um, has to be good news. Mm. I, think, I think what's really um, important as well for women, and I think a lot of women are starting to become educated, is that incontinence um, is something that can can be prevented and cured because the pelvic floor is actually a group of muscles. And I think that that's what a Mm. lot of women don't truly understand. And then that knowing that this is, this is a muscular issue a lot of the time that can be helped with either the pessaries or the vaginal um, um, Mm -hmm. estrogen, um, but they can be strengthened. And the whole pelvic floor is its skeletal muscle that has the ability to be able to actually build up again and get strong again and so to me even if it takes quite some time for that to happen because strength takes a while to build of course um Mm -hmm. there is a light at the end of the tunnel because we're saying to you this is muscle and muscle integrity can be changed with exercise right and so yeah and that's one of the things that I think should give women hope rather than just going I've got incontinence I'm going to just have to wear pads well no you can change your the whole conversation around it now, right? You absolutely can. And, you know, if you think that we are going to live longer, as I said earlier, we're going to spend a third of our lives in the menopause. Um, and, you know, grannies are running marathons. There is no reason why if you can train to uh, run a marathon at 75, you can't train your pelvic floor muscles to stop you leaking. And we really must, as, as, as women um, worldwide, you know, empower ourselves to doing just that. And that's what I've spent the last 23 years doing and beavering away quietly in my little practice. But I now hope that um, this really is, you know, the future for us is changed. Uh, We don't leak when we sneeze anymore. We go, no, actually, we can fix that. Yeah. And we get on and fix it. And so like, 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 moving on from that, just saying about strength work, like you're a big proponent of like women being getting strong, right? Like whether that be their running or their weights or something, you want women yeah. to, to be strong. And so I'm going to end on a question and you know what it is. <laughs> should, women over, should women over 50 do a plank, Jen? <laughs> I think women over 50 should do exactly what they like. Thank they you. should just be careful of the pelvic floor. I'm a pelvic floor expert. So for me, the pelvic floor is the most important thing. And if your pelvic floor is really, really weak, 
you should try to strengthen that first and then you can go back to doing your planks as often as you like. Yeah. Yeah. Work on, work on the problem and then build yourself back up. Of course, everything, I think so. everything's about progression and, and individualizing it to yourself. I, I think that's it. You know, we're all, it has to be an individual thing. And, you know, if you've got a prolapse and um, you're doing sort of serious core work, you should just be a little bit careful and try to work your pelvic floor first and then go back to, um, you know, the core strength as well. Because a pelvic floor is the bottom of the core. We yep. need all four bits of it. Yeah. Uh, to work properly work together that's great yeah well that's right this was a really great conversation Jane I actually can't wait to get <laughs> my hands on the book I physically want the book in my hands and so can you <laughs> tell us um it's been released now 30th of May I believe in the it has. US is it available here in the US it's available on Amazon so I assume so um yeah. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on, um, if you just Google the Pelvic Floor Bible. Um, there are lots and lots of, of outlets available um, to purchase purchase it, both on the Kindle and um, the actual physical book. And the one thing that I really wanted to do with my book is make it not prohibitively expensive. So it is maximum price, £9.99. And I think I, I was determined that it was going to be something that everyone could afford to buy, um, uh, not something that people thought, oh, God, well, actually, uh, you know, I won't because it's too expensive. So it's a little paperback. It's not too long. So hopefully um, it's easy reading. Apparently um, my uh, friends and, and patients who've read it are uh, say it's it, it sounds like me in there so hopefully good. yeah good you're, <laughs> you're, not gonna, you're not gonna you'll get me coming people. through yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the problem like I found when I wrote my menopause book is that the books I was picking up were dry and too medical and I didn't have the actual capacity to be able to read it because one I have a menopause brain and two who's got the time for that just tell me what I need yeah. to know come on and and that's it's, it. In a way, I can actually understand it, right? So, um, yeah. Jane, where is your website as well? Could you tell us what your website is? Yeah, so my website is www.thepelvicfloorbible.com. Dot com. Okay, you're not yes. co.uk. Okay, that's good to know. Dot com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am. And Amanda's been very lovely to talk to you too. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Yep, yeah, and um, keep doing what you're doing and let's keep the conversation going. Thanks very much, Thank you. Jane. Thank you, Amanda. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the show. And now I have a quick favor to ask of you. Would you leave me a review? Every time you leave me a review, it helps me get in front of new listeners. It helps me to continue to put out great content and get fabulous guests on the show. And in return for you doing that, I will send you a free gift. I have a 12-week core focus program called Abs on Fire. All you need to do is two simple things. One, leave me a review on iTunes or Google. Two, email me at amanda at fitandchips.com and I'll wing that program over to you. Thanks so much, guys. The views and advice expressed in this show by myself are not a substitute for conventional medical service. No information here should be interpreted as a medical diagnosis, treatment, or prevention of any disease. If in any doubt, always contact your healthcare provider. Thanks so much for stopping by. Take care. Bye.